Welcome to Consortium News. I'm Kathy Vogan. And I'm Elizabeth Voss. Today we'll be talking to Senator David Shoebridge, a former barrister and current spokesperson for Justice, Defence and Veterans Affairs with the Australian Greens, and Eddie Lloyd, the lawyer for military whistleblower David McBride. McBride, himself a barrister, was convicted and imprisoned for his disclosures to the ABC, Australia's national broadcaster, regarding serious misconduct by the country's special forces in Afghanistan. On May 14th of this year, the very day McBride was sentenced, Australia's Minister of Defence and Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles belatedly released an unclassified three-year report from a body called the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel. He claimed that the release had been delayed pending advice from the Office of Special Investigator on whether the report would or could reasonably be expected to prejudice legal proceedings, specifically current and future war crimes prosecutions. The panel was to look into how cultural and professional reforms were being implemented in the Australian military, as had been the case for four years, and then in accordance with the recommendations laid out in the 2020 Brereton Report, an inquiry into alleged crimes, including war crimes committed by some special forces between 2005 and 2016. Brereton recommended that 19 soldiers be investigated by police for the murder, quote murder, of 39 Afghan prisoners and unarmed civilians, and the cruel treatment of two others. Besides McBride, only one soldier has been prosecuted to date, and oddly enough, McBride's case is neither mentioned as, quote, current by the Minister of Defence nor by the oversight panel, nor has its lengthy report had much attention from the media. The Independent Oversight Panel, led by former Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Vivian Tom, disagreed with the conclusion in the Brereton report that senior commanders should not be held accountable for the murder of 39 Afghans. In that respect, the oversight panel concurred with McBride, stating, quote, there is ongoing anger and bitter resentment amongst present and former members of the special forces, many of whom served with distinction in Afghanistan, that their senior officers have not publicly accepted some responsibility for policies or decisions that contributed to the misconduct, such as the overuse of special forces. The panel noted that, quote, multiple signs were ignored that could have halted alleged war crime much sooner, quote, they included spreading rumours, issues arising from operational reporting, including a formulaic format lacking in detail, reports by locals and non-government organisations, and media commentary. Eddie Lloyd, lawyer for David McBride, you are preparing an appeal for David, who was given little chance of defending himself at trial. His evidence was removed from the courtroom and the judge had ruled out a public interest defence, claiming that McBride's only duty was to follow orders and his order was to keep his mouth shut. Do you think the oversight panel report would have helped David if it had been released earlier? How is the appeal shaping up and can you tell us how David is faring at the moment? Thanks for having me on here, Cathy. I think it's probably fair to say that, yes, the report would have potentially significantly impacted the argument on duty. The panel report has just was just thrown out with the trash on that Tuesday and um, it was scathing, scathing of the Afghanistan inquiry headed up by Paul Brereton. And like you said, the, there were so many signals, there were so many rumours and there were so many reports being made. And in fact, David McBride himself made a report to the Red Cross uh, about the maltreatment of some of the detainees. There is no way that those in the leadership didn't know what was going on at the time. And these incidents were happening for a long time, many, many years, you know, from 2008, at least the rumours were going around. It just defies logic that they didn't have any idea what was going on. And it was almost like when Samantha Kromfowitz was asked to do the report 
and all the rumours were then put into black and white. It's like they were forced. They had to do something. So that's when they set up the inquiry. It was actually the Chief of Army at the time, Angus Campbell, who appointed Paul Brereton as the Deputy IGADF and the head of the IGADF. The inspector himself was James Gaynor, who is still the IGADF at the moment. And when Angus Campbell asked for that inquiry to take place, he asked for the report to be given back to the Chief of Defence Force, who just so happened to be him in 2020. So there's lots of people involved, uh, you know, over this period of time that are maintaining positions throughout this inquiry that have raised an apprehension of bias. And I note that in the recent Department of Veterans Affairs Suicide Royal Commission, there was significant, so much public criticism that the IGADF did not appear independent, that they had to note that in their findings. And that is why there's a recommendation for the IGADF to have its own statute to be its own body. But I don't think that's going to change anything if we continually are appointing former members of the IGADF, because you just can't remove that apprehended bias or actual bias that, you know, many in the public are very concerned about. And we need to have confidence in these agencies. And what I wanted to say about James Gaynor, who is the head of the IGADF, is he was one of the people who was in his role as deputy IGADF at the time McBride made the complaint. He was in the room when he dismissed that complaint to David McBride. And then you have him here in the inquiry with uh, Paul Brereton. So there are many questions to be asked about what conflicts they might have had. And it's really central to David McBride's case and why we should all be raising our eyebrows is his complaint has always centred on what are the leadership covering up. And so the Brereton inquiry, of course, was then handed back. The report was handed back. And thankfully, this independent panel has um, done their report that was scathing of there being no leadership accountability. And what I think is important to note is that it's not just about it's unethical that they didn't, you know, make any leadership accountability. It's actually unlawful. When David McBride was going through military law school, he was taught about the Yamashita principle, which came from a case um, called Yamashita. And that principle is the law. And that principle is it's not about whether you should have should have known. It's about whether you ought to have known. And so there should have been leadership accountability through the Brereton Inquiry. And there are many questions as to people asking questions as to why there wasn't any accountability and still is not any accountability today. And there we have David McBride sitting in jail. uh, And this is exactly why. Yeah. Well, the panel did compare this aberration as they seem to see it, to what happens in the corporate world. A failure of a company, some kind of wrongdoing, the people at the top always bear a part of the responsibility. And the panel didn't see why that wouldn't be the case in the military as well. Senator Shoebridge, there is a whole chapter of the oversight panel report dedicated to military ethics. They describe a flawed decision-making process called triangulation, where there is leeway for war crimes to be committed if that will produce a favourable outcome for our side. They say, the panel says, triangulation must be replaced by natural law, where war crimes are always the Mm. wrong course of action. And the government seems to agree. Are we moving in the right direction now? Well, I mean, to the extent the oversight panel clearly said that the behaviour of Australian forces in Afghanistan was well outside any what should be an accepted norm of behaviour for Australian troops, and there's been a small degree of acceptance for that um, by the government, there's a tiny progression. But, I mean, what's the real lesson the Australian Defence Force have learned from Afghanistan? Well, they've learned that if you're on the ground actively committing war crimes, then if the evidence is so compelling um, that the government is forced to act, well, then a handful of those people may at some point, years in the future, be held to account. But everybody with any sort of gold braid on their shoulder has learned that no mud will ever stick to them, that they can ignore rumours, they can ignore media reports, they can ignore the scuttlebutt in the bar, they can ignore informal reports that are coming to them, 
They can ignore concerns that have been given to them by their allies. They can ignore all of that and permit war crimes to continue and they'll keep their shiny brass, um, gold probably, on their epaulettes. They'll keep their job. They'll keep their pension. They'll keep their honours and honorifics. And if the worst happens, maybe, maybe 10 years down the track, they may lose one of their medals. Now, if that's the lesson we want the ADF to learn, that's that's okay. Maybe that's what the government wants our Australian Defence Force to learn. Um, for myself, I think that's one of the most dangerous lessons you could imagine um, because the people ultimately with, with the greatest amount of responsibility for what happened are the people in charge who, in the case of Afghanistan, kept putting the same troops back time after time after time after time in almost never-ending rotations back into Afghanistan. They kept spending sending special forces in. That was a command decision um, because they thought that the Australian special forces were getting the job done and were building a reputation for being utterly ruthless and therefore were providing some kind of benefit to our ally, the United States, who wouldn't permit their own troops to engage in that kind of behaviour. This was the Australian Defence Force trying to desperately be relevant to the United States war effort. And it just turns out that the, the relevance that they saw was Australian troops behaving in a lawless and ruthless fashion with a degree of notoriety and cruelty that the United States Special Forces troops would not do, and they thought that was our unique contribution to the Afghan war effort. I can't imagine a, a worse set of lessons that we could draw from that conflict. So, yes, there's there's been mock accountability, and we can probably, you know, deconstruct the mock accountability a bit in this discussion. But actually, the two lessons are this. The ADF should always try and find some sort of special niche role to support the United States, in this case, it happened to be a special brand of ruthless cruelty, um, ruthless unlawful cruelty, and and, and for, for the ADF's purposes, being relevant to the United States was what it was all about, and that kind of worked in their mind. And, and thankfully, they can also take the lesson that they almost certainly won't be held to account if you're in a senior leadership position. Now, um, as we head into a very uncertain period where we have our government absolutely committed to... Um, trying to find some relevance in the alliance with the United States, I think that's a really, really troubling lesson. So does it matter what's in this overview, independent overview report? Does it matter that they continue to signal these problems? Will that change anything or is it just going to stay the same in your view? Well, it won't change anything until we change the, the collective willingness in the federal parliament to actually... Um, hold the senior leadership of the Australian Defence Force to account. They're obviously not going to do it themselves. They've proven that time and time again. Um, and, and we have a parliament that's dominated by what I like to call the war parties, you know, the, the Labor so-called notionally centre-left, um, the coalition party, which is, you know, well well to the right. But when it comes to um, defence policy, you, you, you couldn't put a, you know, razor blade between them in terms of defence policy. They are fundamentally committed to Australia having a sort of secondary role in the US alliance. They want the Australian Defence Force to find a kind of relevance in the US alliance. This was the relevance they found in Afghanistan. They'll be searching for some other kind of relevance, whether it's with AUKUS submarines or some other kind of secondary relevance um, going forward. And they, they have shown absolutely no appetite to hold senior leadership to account. And, in fact, you, we could roll the history on a little bit just to close the arc, um, since the oversight report was handed down um, a few months ago, in the last parliamentary session, uh, um, just after the uh, a landmark Royal Commission report was handed down about veteran suicides, which showed deep, deep misgivings about the leadership and the lack of um, uh, responsibility in the leadership. In that same week, a few days afterwards, the Defence Minister, a guy called Richard Miles, he gets very offended if you call him the defence minister. You have to call him the deputy prime minister. Oh, okay. Very um, status driven. Um, but um, defence minister Miles um, um, handed down the government's final response to the Afghanistan war crimes issue. Um, and this was, they said, this is it. This is our concluding position on it. You know, there may be a couple of 
other criminal um, offences that grind their way through out of the Brereton report, but from an organisational government response, this is our that the executive's final position on it, and they stripped nine medals from unnamed officers, and that's it. They stripped nine medals from mm. unnamed officers and said, okay, there you go, there's your accountability. Um, no, yeah, no one would ever know who it was. Yeah, and, and we do know um, that the most senior officer, the former Chief of Defence Force, who at critical times was actually in charge of the Australian deployment in Afghanistan, albeit he was over in a military base um, a few thousand kilometres away from that. But the most senior officer, a guy called General Campbell, he actually wrote the report about whether he should keep or not keep his medal, as well as other senior officers' medals. He wrote his own report, marked his own homework, um, and he concluded that he should keep the medal. Um, And so he's kept his medal, even though he was in charge of the deployment at critical times when these war crimes were committed. Um, That's accountability for you, Australian defence style. Yes. Um, I was going to pass uh, over to Elizabeth, but, you know, while we're on the, the final version, there was talk, there were reports by the ABC, um, Australia's national broadcaster, that the, the government wanted to compensate the families of these victims, but there was a problem because there was no link to uh, banks in Afghanistan and certainly no connection with the Taliban. Do you think that that's ever going to happen, David, or are, are they making enough effort to find a solution? Are they making enough effort? Absolutely not. They have put in place the regulatory regime for a compensation scheme to pay modest amounts of compensation to Afghan families um, and victims of Australian war crimes. Um, Most people think that that's a woefully inadequate system. It requires often desperately poor Afghan families to somehow know about the regulations, to engage with those regulations, to bring their evidence to Australia, um, and present the material. Um, the Australian government refuses to do any any formal outreach into um, Afghanistan um, mm. in order to promote it, refuses to have any engagement, and there are complex reasons behind this, some good, some bad, um, with the Taliban regime at all, but also hasn't partnered with any third party, whether it's Red Crescent or Red Cross, to get out and actively engage with the families, even of known victims of these war crimes so there is a scheme in place but it's this kind of scheme that you know it's almost designed to fail the victims um you know i hope that there will be some kind of recompense for the victims through the scheme but it's um yeah it's it's very much self-serving um scheme from australia's perspective And, and also you know when you talk to people who have been in afghanistan they they point out that if if anyone within afghanistan accesses is openly accessing money from the Australian government um, that is likely to put a red flag on them from the Taliban perspective so some kind of formal engagement with the with the authorities would you think be necessary even to provide a, a safe enough environment for the scheme to have a potential of working they should have thought about that uh, you know before they started before they killing people or they mm. started shooting people in cold blood who were largely in fired. cold blood yeah, yeah. on video and have it captured on video. Unarmed civilians, yeah. it's disgraceful. And it just, I am also told that most of these operations, um, there was actually a live feed from the, the soldiers as they were being deployed into the command, um, to a command level. They were getting live feeds about what was happening. So the idea that command responsibility is um, they didn't know or they couldn't have found out is is farcical. So you can add that on to the long list of uh, signs, <laughs> undeniable signs. Um, okay, Elizabeth, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, Eddie, I, my first question is aimed towards you. I wanted to ask what impact the panel review might have on McBride's appeal moving forward, if any. Well, it's pretty difficult when you're running an appeal. We're bound to the decisions that were made um, in the lower court in terms of the severity appeal of the sentence and in terms of how what avenues we have to appeal the conviction. Um, So that was not evidence that was before the court. It would be pretty much impossible, I think, to try and get that evidence in. And at the end of the day, what it does really is it just corroborates um, the, the basis of 
David McBride's complaint in that he had grave concerns that the leadership were covering something up. He didn't know exactly what, but he knew that something very uh, awry was happening. The more questions he asked, the more answers became quite suspicious. And, uh, you know, he really triggered something that opened up this big Pandora's box that we can now perhaps speculate about what it was all about. Um, but at the time, yes, he was just uh, trying to get some answers for some questions about why there was a misapplication of the law or why it was being applied unequally to some soldiers. And uh, instead of getting an answer, he was charged and prosecuted. Um, and, you know, it was it's so ironic. The other day I came across a news article about Ben Robert Smith's defamation trial. And in the trial he was found, it came out in evidence, that he was found to have classified secret material, which was actually footage because, as David said, there was not only just live feed, but there's drone footage out there of all of these incidents. And why hasn't that, you know, come forward? It's secret, it's classified, and Ben Robert Smith obtained it. And that is exactly the same criminal conduct that they charged David McBride with under 73A of the Defence Act. It's uh, communicate or obtain. But no one has charged Ben Robert Smith. No one has charged a journalist because it was in the public interest, according to the Attorney General. And it's just David McBride that was charged. So, you know, one questions whether or not, you know, there is something malicious in the intent, intent of the Attorney General and or the Commonwealth DPP in, in, in charging and prosecuting David McBride when the same has, standard has not been applied to other people. Yeah, and speaking of Ben Robert Smith, um, you know, for our audience who may not be, you know, in depth with the background of, of the Australian political situation, can you explain exactly who he is and was and why it's so incriminating that he has not been prosecuted given his history? Well, he's he's one of probably many people that we, we do, not that many, hopefully, people that were found in the Afghanistan inquiry. I think there were 19 individuals um, that were suspected of committing about 39 unlawful killings. His name has been floating around for a while. He, uh, the newspaper printed, Fairfax newspapers printed um, something about him and he decided to take them to trial for defamation of his character and he, he lost that. I understand he's appealing it, um, but it was very interesting because a lot of information came out about what was going on over there in Afghanistan uh, and the judge Basanko found that it was more probable than not that he did actually uh, murder innocent Afghanistan civilians. But to this day, he hasn't been prosecuted um, and perhaps some cynical people think that the Afghanistan inquiry was set up in a particular way to avoid um, certain people being prosecuted because the the evidence that was gathered, a lot of the time it was compelled in the inquiry so that evidence can't be used in a criminal prosecution and the Office of Special Investigator was set up after the Afghanistan inquiry to quarantine what evidence could be used. There were attempts to charge Ben Robert Smith, as I understand, but that was withdrawn because the evidence would not have been admissible. So it's very, um, it's more gaslighting for David McBride, who's just over four months in custody now, sitting there, who really was just trying to do the right thing. Um, and it's just been shut down and silenced. And we see other people who have got clouds of suspicion raving around their head, walking free with medals on them. And all of the commanders that awarded those medals over that entire period where all of these rumours and reports were going on, they're walking free as well. And that has been David McBride's, the source of his complaint. So to summarise all of that, you've got the person who blew the whistle on these war crimes sitting in prison. Meanwhile, you have someone who very likely committed these war crimes and also obtained that secret information is walking free and will likely never be prosecuted. That's what I'm understanding. That's the reality. And as time goes on, it's harder and harder to secure convictions. We know Oliver Schultz is the only person who has been charged with murder out of Afghanistan, but that was all caught on video, um, you know, and where's all the other video that the, that could be obtained to to charge other people? I'm not sure. But that that's, what, 10 years since that happened, and that's still in the local courts, and I understand they're going to be contesting committals. It's going to be stuck in the local court for a long time. By the time it comes to trial, the delay, people 
skills, memories, things like that make it very difficult to secure a conviction. So it's looking less and less likely that people will. I'm not giving up hope yet. I do believe in justice and I do believe in the courts and I do believe we'll get justice for David McBride and freedom at some point. It might not look the way people think it should look these days, but he will be validated uh, in the court of public opinion, that is for sure. Yeah, and I think also, uh, you know, leading on from that, the panel review, although it may have been critical in some ways and kind of antagonistic towards the Brereton report, I noticed that it at the very beginning of the of the panel review, it basically argued that individual soldiers who had per, had uh, perpetrated these crimes should not be punished because of the effect it might have on their families who were innocent, uh, you know, people, innocent bystanders, and the loss of uh, benefits to those family members may be um, basically not worth the prosecution of the individual soldiers. The panel review argued instead that uh, those who were higher up should have faced more accountability, with, uh, including politicians, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a cop-out itself? What do you make of that? And I'd, I'd like both of you to, to take a gander at that question. Well, well, some some cynical people have also commented that the Afghanistan inquiry might have been set up in the way it was to avoid um, having jurisdiction to enter the International Court of Criminal Justice, um, because once a member state, and Australia is a member state of the International um, Court of Criminal Justice, once the member state, if they're doing something, which is the Office of Special Investigator now following the inquiry, then we don't print in the face you have jurisdiction to enter to make a complaint because the ICC is interested in the leadership and command accountability. They're not interested in, in, in you know, throwing the soldiers under the bus. So whilst there's something on foot, and goodness knows how long the OSI is going to be going for, but as long as that's on foot, we prima facie don't have jurisdiction. Though I know Senator Lambie has uh, lodged a complaint, I think in June last year, and we still haven't got uh, acknowledgement for, from the Secretary, I think Karim over there in the UN to, to, to say whether or not they're even going to proceed with that. And um, so who knows what's going on there. But there, there is one in the wings. There is a complaint in the wings, but nothing's happened as yet. And perhaps a challenge to uh, an obstacle to that, to that is because the OSI is still investigating. Senator Shoebridge, if you wanted to comment on that issue at all. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the history, and I think the, um, you know, the Burton report was set up in 2016. It took a number of years. At the end of it, it the, the conclusion was that none of the evidence that it obtained could ever be used for any criminal prosecutions. There was concerns that that entire process had maybe degraded the witnesses' um, independent recollections. That's now a kind of feast for defence lawyers. Then having made those conclusions, they had to set up a whole new unit, multi-million dollar unit, to sort of start afresh and actually start, start independently investigating the alleged war crimes that came out of the Brereton report. That takes a bunch more years. Um, one has now come to trial, um, but as Eddie says, that's tied up in committals and largely the committals and the, the sort of pre-trial process. Um, that's taking so long because of the way the Brereton report operated and the impact that had on witnesses' recollections and a alleged if it infected the independent separate criminal prosecution that, that could see the prosecution fall over. So maybe if you wanted to set up a system that has the appearance of accountability, um, has a lot of legal process, has a lot of barristers employed, maybe a judge thrown in, but kind of is guaranteed to, to provide the smallest possible amount of actual justice, well, you'd design this one, wouldn't you? Um, and that's what Australians are witnessing right now. And, and that's what serving members of the ADF are witnessing right now. And, you know, I'm often quite critical of the objectives of the Australian Defence Force, um, very critical of the senior leadership. Um, but there are good people inside the Australian Defence Force who want to be part of an organisation that complies with international laws, that has ethical rules for engagement, that holds people to account when they breach ethical rules of engagement and actually sees punishment held out. And then it's important for them that those values are upheld in the ADF and they are betrayed as well in this process. Um, I would describe it as systemic betrayal. Betrayal, first of all, of the Afghan people because the Australian Defence Force knew 
that war crimes were being committed, knew that there was unspeakable brutality being meted out by Australian Defence Force members over there in special force units, special forces units, and they did nothing about it. Um, then when they were forced to act, they set up a process that they knew would take years and put in so many legal complications that um, the likelihood of getting anything like timely justice is zero, as it turns out. And then they also go through a set of convoluted processes to desperately ensure that nobody in a position of leadership will ever be held to account. Um, and, and even when you get to the end of that, the oversight panel says, well, um, sure, senior people should be held to account through some mysterious process that they haven't identified. Um, but then the actual people who did the war crimes, well, they should be let off because it's mean to their families. Um, I've never heard that argument used about people who commit crimes of violence in our society. I've never heard anybody say, well, don't hold that murderer to account because it'd be mean for his mum, you know, or don't hold that particular violent assailant to account because what about his, you know, his, his or, his or her, her partner? You know, they may lose their superannuation benefits. I've never heard that argument and it would be thrown out as obscene in any other circumstance. Yet for some reason... Um, um, it's been used here again to avoid justice for war crimes. It's 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 an obscene argument. It should never have been made. I mean, it definitely wasn't taken into consideration when McBride was prosecuted, or when any civilian, as you mentioned, has been prosecuted. When Assange yeah. was prosecuted separately, it's just unheard of completely. Uh, uh, I also, if the judge said, that... "I find find David McBride guilty," but you know, I care about his daughters, and um, for that reason, he won't go to jail. Um, was, would be unheard of in the criminal justice system. Absolutely. I wanted to get both of your thoughts on the total lack of corporate media coverage of this panel review. I mean, obviously it's a very long review, but do you think that that is, you know, a run of the mill, part of the course, unusual at all, not surprising? Um, well, I'll have first go, Eddie, and then I'll throw to you. I mean, one of our large media players, um, what we have a very concentrated media market in Australia, and one of our large commercial media players is called Seven West Media, owned by a billionaire who lives over in Western Australia, one of our more remote states, the big mining state. Um, uh, he owns Seven West Media, and he is an unapologetic um, supporter of Ben Robert Smith, who has been found by a judge to be a, to have committed war crimes and murder on a civil standard, you know, in that defamation trial, that media baron funded his defence, actually employed him within his media organisation on a very high salary and funded his defence and continues to fund him, is my understanding. Um, and you will be surprised to know that Seven West Media did not cover in any detail the oversight report and the commercial media more broadly had a very modest coverage of it. There are two publicly owned um, broadcaster media outlets, um, SBS, which is our multicultural media outlet. They did cover it in more detail. I think their audience did want to hear about that and were concerned about the lack of um, accountability. But it's a very small media player. Our larger public broadcaster, the, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, rolled its arm over, I think would be the description I would use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been very, very, very disappointing um, that this hasn't got any airplay at all, really, aside from a few people tweeting about it. You know, really, it was the responsibility of the government to make this public and to not sit on it. In fact, they sat on it from the date it was released, I think, on the 8th of November, and David McBride's trial started just days later, and then they released it on his sentence date. Now, that might just be a coincidence, um, but I actually don't think it was a coincidence. And I think it was the onus was on on the government to to talk about this report. It was part of the Afghanistan inquiry, and it should have started there. And then we might have seen a little bit more media, but um, it's been very disappointing. And you know, Channel Seven were never going to report it because of the, uh, the the boss of Channel Seven, Kerry Stokes, who was actually the chair of the Australian War Memorial, appointed by Governor General Hurley. And he was there at the War Memorial as the chair at the time that they decided to do the huge statue and installation of Ben Robert Smith in there. And it's him as well that has promised to fund anybody's defence uh, that is charged by the OSI following the Afghanistan inquiry. So there was never going to be any joy uh, 
from Channel 7 and very disappointing in our public broadcasters for not making more hay with this. Mm. Yeah, I think it's worth saying that Ben Robert Smith was kind of selected as a poster boy. He really looked the part. He was tall, muscular, and his image was completely destroyed and there was a defamation case which he lost. He's an embarrassment, but he's also a criminal. And when you were talking about good people in the ADF, David, of course, who was I thinking of? Good people like David McBride, who was only doing his job, in my view. There was an effort to do a character assassination of David McBride by the government in the lead up to and during the course of his trial. And the character assassination of David McBride was, oh, David McBride, this is the, and it was it was backgrounding coming out of the, the Labor government to the media. And it was also partly, and Eddie could speak to this in more detail than I can, that the, the submissions that were being put on sentence to the, um, to the, to the judge. And it was, um, oh, David McBride, he's not, he's not an angel. Um, he's, he's actually trying to excuse the war crimes of the people who committed the war crimes, the individual, you know, the Ben Robert Smiths of this world. He was trying to excuse those and say they should all be let off scot-free and um, responsibility should only go to the leadership. And, uh, and, and they said, well, you know, but the Brereton reporter said the leadership are, are free of any responsibility. And so this guy, far from being a hero, their argument was he's actually trying to let war criminals get off scot-free. Now, it was an obscene distortion of what David's position was. Yeah. David's position was, well, of course, people in leadership should be held to account and it's wrong just to hang out to dry the people on the ground when the senior leadership uh, are walking away absolutely free of any, any kind of um, um, accountability at all. And he was deeply disturbed by that. Now, it now turns out that the oversight panel is almost exactly on song with what David McBride was doing. Now, if, if that oversight panel had been out at the time of the trial, then that sort of backgrounding character assassination that the government was doing behind the scenes with the media, and, and they were in part, they were aided by the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, um, aided them in, aided in that character assassination of David McBride. Um, if, if that had been out in the public, it would have been much, much harder to run that particularly nasty attack on David. And, and, and before I hand over to Eddie, I'll, I'll just say this. You don't have to be an angel to be a whistleblower. All your motives don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have come without, you know, any blemish to your character. You just need to be telling the public something the public should hear, which is in the public interest that is otherwise being hidden from them. Yeah. And Eddie, yeah. David, of course, was a legal officer. Yeah. And so it was his job to monitor and supervise and advise and report. That's right. And that, and that's where I feel he's been unfairly criticised. And this binary narrative that's out and about in some parts of the media and the public where he was only concerned in the over-investigation of soldiers, ipso facto, he was covering up war crimes. I mean, it is such a binary narrative and it's not consistent with the evidence um, at all. And it, I guess it's a boring story that people don't want to hear, that David McBride was a lawyer when you're admitted to practice and as a government lawyer he has extra responsibilities to be a model litigant, but every lawyer has got a duty to the court and to the public to in the administration of justice because justice must be seen to be done. So lawyers must be seen to be doing the right thing and upholding the rule of law without fear or favour. David McBride saw rules being misapplied. He saw some soldiers being innocent who were innocent being prosecuted and others who had shadows of doubt around them not being touched at all. And he asked, why is there a misapplication of the law? That is the founding principle of the rule of law. Everyone should be equal before the law. As, uh, as a lawyer, you must say something when you see that, and especially as a government lawyer. Um, but it's a boring story that no one really wanted to tell. Um, it's much more fun to tell a graphic story about war crimes and to assassinate someone's character because it's convenient and it's easy and it's lazy. It's lazy, lazy journalism. And like David McBride, he is a whistleblower and he is a war crimes whistleblower. And like every other whistleblower, they are all just doing their job 
And in fact, the high profile whistleblowers we know about are people who have done their job extremely well. Jeff Morris, Troy Stoltz, Richard Boyle, so of the ATO, the big banks, um, and Gaming New South Wales, they're all doing their jobs extremely well. And that seems to be a problem. And that is what should send a shiver down the backsides of everyone in Australia, because these people are high profile, but it could happen in your own workplace. And that is really impacting our freedom to speak out. And that's why David McBride's case is so important to every single person. And that's why we need to make sure we raise as much awareness about it um, as we can. Well, you didn't answer that last part of my first question, and that is, how is he at the moment? I have regular conferences with him a couple of times a week, Thursdays and Sundays, um, and I'm here in Canberra now to do some face-to-face -face conferences. Um, you know, he wavers, he wavers. Um, he's in a safer part of the jail now, but let's face it, you know, there's no real safe place for him in custody. He is in a house with people who have committed murder, um, pedophiles, uh, all kinds of, of people like that. And he's a really, um, you know, brave, brave person, David McBride, and he always has his glass half full. But I know him well enough uh, to know that he is living on edge. You know, his uh, nervous system is, you know, he's just, it doesn't sleep that well at all every night you know you've got to keep your eye open um just in case uh, something might happen because that has happened to him already um but he's got a bit of a routine happening now so he's trying to pass the days uh doing some exercise and, and things like that but it's it's it can be very boring in jail as well um but for him as well it's important for um, me to have conferences with him and for him to get some you know some counseling in there yeah. because he's this is just more gaslighting. You know, he's sitting yeah. there just every day going, I just cannot believe this has happened. I cannot yes. believe this has happened. The fact that he's still mentally strong is, you know, a testament to his character, really, because yes. I don't know that I could have withstood what he has withstood at all. David, if you have to go now, that's fine with us. Um, I was told that you had another appointment at 5 yep. o'clock. I, I do. I've got it. I've, I've... I, I have to be off by five. So if this is a convenient time, Cathy and Eddie and Elizabeth. Yes, we're very grateful for yeah. your participation. No, no, and thanks for doing it. I mean, actually digging into the um, the oversight panel review, um, it's incredibly timely. Um, and rest assured, I will be raising many of these issues in we have this process called Senate Estimates yeah. where we get to question the senior bureaucrats about how, what and why. Yeah. Um, I think there'll be, you know, obviously plenty of questions we'll be asking um, of a variety of different bureaucrats um, in early November as well. Yes. Well, you, you, yep. you must have heard the good news about Julian Assange. He's going to, Indeed. you know, he's That's been declared a, a prisoner, um, political prisoner by PACE, the um, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and invited to speak in Strasbourg to give testimony, and then they will debate it. The, and, the full assembly will debate the matter the following day. And that is in the interests of protecting not only journalists, but whistleblowers as well. So I think that's going to be good news for Australia too. Yeah, well, I so, hope so. Because I mean, we were, I was, we were also incredibly glad when Julian finally came and, and came free. And, um, and, and, but there was a terrible irony because the airport that Julian flew into, um, having finally been free from years of detention for blowing the whistle on war crimes, basically, um, in, in that case in, in Iraq, um, just like was less than four kilometres away from where Julian lands and was finally free um, to where David had been put in jail just literally a month before Julian landed. Um, and we had, you know, our Prime Minister say, well, this is a wonderful achievement getting Julian free. Whereas it was his government that consciously put David in jail just a few yes. kilometres. So the more we can hear from Julian and other whistleblowers, uh, the more we can actually force change on our governments. David Shoebridge, thank you very right. much. See you all. In the Shoebridge. Yeah, David Woods. Glad to have you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Eddie, just to round up, you've, you've surely got a fundraiser going. To move. Oh, we do too. We're we're trying. Tell us about it's it. pretty, yeah, it's it's a it costs a lot of money to run an appeal. I've got two barristers briefed. We're all doing well. I'm doing pro bono. 
Um, they're cutting their rates significantly. We're nowhere near what we need to be. The fundraiser can be found at chuffed.org forward slash project forward slash David McBride. Um, and, you know, we, we're facing a government that spent $2.5 million getting him in jail, prosecuting him and getting him in jail. And we know that they're going to spend probably more than that in uh, trying to keep him in jail. So we are appealing to the public to really help us because this is in the public interest, this case, and um, we're really hoping that the public can chuck in a few bucks instead of having that coffee, um, chuck five bucks into the fundraiser if you can once a week um, and we will get to our goal because we can't do this without the public and we mean support, turning up, emailing, going to the MP's office, um, writing to David McBride, but also importantly, we can't put the appeal, get the appeal going unless we've got money in the bank to pay people. So, um, and people can buy his book as well on his website. So there are a lot of ways that you can help raise awareness about David McBride and help fund his appeal. Yes, well, I hope to be back in Canberra for that when it, when it comes around. Like I was in the courtroom for the for, for the, the, the trial, yeah. but um, yeah, and I I wish you well. Thank uh, Elizabeth, you. do you have any more questions for Eddie? No, just I wanted to thank you as well for your time and being willing to come on, and really appreciated talking to you today. Thank Loved you. it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're yeah. welcome, Eddie. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye bye.